Wonderful season to be practicing Kusumono in a, in a really spectacular way to kind of break the monotony of handling the tree form on a continual basis. The understory just as valuable, just as interesting. And tonight the focus of this particular piece on the creation of Kusumono is the utilization, number one, of plants that have succulent characteristics, and we'll dive into succulents specifically. And number two, how we use a singular plant and the container that we select to maximize the design opportunities. I'm gonna throw a lot of options your way. Uh, this is more than anything, not a, a uh, effort to tell you what to do, it's to give you ideas of how you can maximize these readily accessible at any garden center, nursery, uh, home improvement facility, and a beautiful contextual container to be able to really elevate the aesthetic of the understory plants that we get to and have the pleasure to enjoy and to kind of maximize their ability to be something more than a plant in a pot. Bonsai is the tree form, right? Suiseki, the appreciation of viewing stones, this is like the geological sort of land representation component or, or ancillary practice of aesthetic art form slash, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, hobby, pursuit, craft, however you quantify that. Kusumono or stakusa, right? Depending on how we choose to view this, where it's being utilized, kusumono standalone, it's its own exhibitionable piece versus shtakusa, which is something that is a companion to, to, to create some sort of continuity or dialogue about environment, season, uh, or context for the display of a bonsai tree becomes, right, when we push it into the realm of Kusumono, when we think about the presentation of the understory plants as a standalone, beautiful, and, and really highly conceptualized aesthetic, that now becomes its own thing as well. It becomes its own sort of uh, exhibitable, displayable, or aesthetically valuable component, right? And, and tonight, when we start to dig into this, the goal is to say, listen, taking one understory plant, one non-tree related perennial piece, and, and not necessarily only perennial, we can do annuals as Kusumono as well, just to sort of back into this, right? Some of our, our, our commonly accepted generic plants in the world, to plant wheat in the early spring and see wheat bear fruit or seed come the, the, the peak of summer. This is like such a seasonal practice in Japan and such a beautiful representation of what an annual can do in the form of kusumono, of seasonal reference, of contextual uh, continuity display, and, and just sort of the dialogue that comes along with these plants. But we're gonna be talking about perennials tonight and perennials specifically, plants that have succulent characteristics. How do we take a singular plant and maximize its aesthetic value? What are the techniques to planting it, et cetera? But more than that, how do we bring about with the com compilation or the combination of container, the best possible aesthetics? Sedum is the predominant piece, but these are readily available pieces. And when we start to look at these, right, you understand sort of a dwarf hens and chicks. Here's a full size hens and chicks. Right, when we start to look at these, these are readily available pieces. Now, if we just plop these into a pot, awesome, awesome, they're great, right? We say succulents, succulents are the rage in the horticultural community, right? Everybody wants succulents, apartment living, close quarter living, indoor living, let's cultivate succulents. But have we maximized? And do we understand what can happen over the course of time to be able to truly elevate that succulent characteristic plant to a level that is truly appreciable and maxes it out or creates some sort of contextual dialogue that allows us to tap into it and enjoy it on a deeper level. That's, that's really the goal. That's got to be the goal if we're going to push into Kusumono and call Kusumono an art form, okay? So from that perspective, when we start to talk about kind of elevating this, first and foremost, let's establish a baseline understanding of succulent, okay? Succulent is not a type of plant. Succulent is a descriptive characteristic of a plant that has parts that are thick, fleshy, and engorged with water, oftentimes to be able to endure drought or a lack of water. Okay, so succulent, when we talk about, we've got conifers, we've got deciduous, we've got broadleafed evergreen, we've got succulents. No, boom, it doesn't belong in that category. Okay, it's not a conifer, it's not a deciduous, it's not a family of plants, right? 
it is a description of characteristics, and that's something that we must understand. It's the fleshy, water and gorge tissue that makes a plant a succulent, right? But a succulent is just a description of plants that have that characteristic, okay? So when we look at this, we're dealing with succulents. We're talking about plants that do have a tolerance to drought based on the, the amount of water that they store in their tissue that leads to that swollen sort of really interesting, really uh, low maintenance, really uh, adaptable, and potentially even effortless to cultivate indoor environment. That's what we're kind of quantifying as succulent, all right? Now, if we're gonna tap into the design notion of succulent, we have to know a few things. First and foremost, I'm just gonna pull this sedum out here. This is uh, sedum carl. Carl is the, uh, is the variety or cultivar. And we're saying, listen, you have a minty green kind of foliar mass here, right? Succulent being very delicate. Uh, these can break very easily based on the fact that they're so full of water. We don't wanna mishandle these by crushing, etc. Okay, but when we look at this minty green, kind of that bluish green color, and we understand, and one of the most important Important things when we're creating a, a composition with any sort of kusumono. What is the finished height and what is the color of the bloom? When does it bloom? Okay, because when we create a composition, we've got to be looking at, okay, are we creating a composition that takes advantage of the foyer color, of the foyer texture, of the foyer size, of the foyer scale? Or are we starting to tap in, are we creating a composition that takes advantage of the flower, of the season? of the environmental insinuation. Because each of these efforts and each of these concise intentional decisions will generate a different container combination that will maximize our ability to appreciate the plant at that time. Okay, and if we take sedum, coral variety, right? We say, listen, pinkish red bloom. And this is the beauty of Joy Creek is they give you all this information. I don't have this off the top of my head. Okay, pinkish red bloom, awesome, 18 inches tall. Now you're looking at this right now and you're saying, well, that's like, that's like two inches tall, right? Two inches tall, boom, two inches, love it. That's gonna get 18 inches tall. That size, that height has got to change your decisions around what container you're going to put this kusumono in. And this is part of one of the great discoveries and explorations of kusumono is you start with this. You don't start with the 18 inch tall full size piece that's going to grow in the garden environment. And when we put it into this confined environment, there's a chance it might not get to 18 inches, but it's gonna get much taller than the two inch height that it has now. So as we see this evolve in the kusumono container, we recognize, wow, this aesthetic is gonna change, okay? So now we've gotta decide. I've got my sedum, subspecies Carl, awesome. Am I going to tap into the capacity design-wise to utilize color? Let's just start with color in terms of a selection of containers. Now this is kind of like a, like a, a, a blue-green, right? I've got a color wheel here. I've actually got some amazing color wheels here, okay? And when we start to look at the color wheel and we start to look at blue green, blue green just below green here, right? And we look at blue green and we go across here and we rec recognize complementary color, complementary color is gonna be slightly reddish orange, slightly reddish orange, okay? This is the color combination. When we look blue green, right? Here's green, here's yellow green, here's blue green, although it doesn't really show up that way, right? And we're looking at this and we're saying, wow, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of uh, orangish red. Right, that's our complementary color composition. Okay, now when we talk co complementary colors, we recognize complementary causes things to pop, causes high energy visually, right? Now, if you're trying to create a calming space, complementary is not the kind of combination that you wanna create with the container that you put this piece into, right? If you're trying to create quiet, Maybe we go with a green container, maybe we go with a blue container and create an analogous color combination, okay? Right next to each other on the color wheel. This is calming in terms of the way that the colors interact and the containerized environment. So if we're just saying, listen, I'm gonna tap into design-wise and I'm looking at the foyer type, I'm gonna be looking at complementary as sort of a, a, an orangey red or analogous as, as a, a blue or a green, okay? Now, we're talking about the foyer color. What about the bloom color? The bloom color is a pinkish red. Now all of a sudden, we're kind of talking about a pinkish red being right in here, kind of around this range. A green container right next to that minty green. We have an analogous color combination over the course of the year here, and then when it blooms, we get a complementary color combination. This is interesting. 
This means that we can have a very calming composition. This plant can be very quiet in the corner of our, of our garden, on the benches of our bonsai, inside of our apartment environment, on our windowsill, in our kitchen, on our dining table, wherever you're gonna use this piece, right? And suddenly it blooms and boom, something completely different happens. And isn't it interesting that when we look at that blue-green of the foyer mass, and we look at that reddish-orange, right, and we're talking about reddish-pink, that those are complementary colors that are naturally going to occur in this actual physical plant, right? Really, really fascinating, okay? So let me pull up some containers just to talk about this. Now, again, we want to be very clear. 18 inches, this is going to be a relatively tall piece, okay? And we have a variety of things that we can utilize. I'm going to use the container to constrict the space to a fairly significant degree. Okay, I might divide some pieces, but I'm just gonna pull up a few different things that we might be able to utilize, and let's kind of see what jives with us, okay? So I've got some Horst Heinzel riders here. I also have a really beautiful concrete Aaron Kupferman. I love this piece, and I think this piece is very interesting, right? Now we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about form, we're gonna talk about texture. Right now we're just simply dialoguing about color, okay? I also have some insinuations when we start to talk about this of maybe some colors that are gonna exist as accents. The Heinzel Rider with the red bottom, love that red bottom, and that red bottom is always gonna be a part of it. Now when we plant it, we recognize that's gonna be filled. We're gonna have more of the blue and the white, but we always get that red on the bottom as an accent. That could be interesting during flowering, maybe not, okay? Now, just as far as color combinations are concerned, when we start to talk about this and we really start to look at this, this is probably the biggest pop factor right here, right? We're talking about sort of that red, maybe a little bit of an orangey red. We're talking about that foyer mass. We're talking about 18 inches of height, which is going to give us verticality, nice container that's going to contain it. And when we talk about Kusumono, we're also seeking that age that accumulates because I'm going to put this into this dish and I'm going to wait as long as I possibly can before I ever repot it again. And a lot of our Kusumono, we leave in that container and we never repot it, or at least we don't repot that any time in the near future because the constriction of that environment and the ability, specifically when we talk about succulent characteristic plants to be able to tolerate low water environment, means that they can start to constrict and mound and create these radical mature forms inside of this confined environment. And it's not, negative to the plant and it's not uh, unhealthy and it's not mean. It's just what the plant is adapting to and giving us a characteristic that shows time and age and maturation. And this is when we start to see the plant carrying the big load of elevating the aesthetic, aesthetic quality beyond what we can immediately produce now, right? But there's gonna be joy the moment that we plant this and then there's gonna be that aging and that accumulation of patina, if you will, over the course of time. And this is really where Kusumono starts to take that next step, okay? So just from the perspective of this piece, I wanna treat this piece as a color combination. We'll dive into proportion and we'll dive into texture on two other pieces. But let's go ahead and let's treat this as a color combination. Now the red gives me complementary, makes it pop right now. Right now is a foyer mask, the form, the round form with verticality. Whenever we have verticality, there's multiple ways we can tap into maximizing verticality as an aesthetic. We can elongate laterally to take advantage of verticality, okay? Or we can constrict laterally and give ourselves a little bit more depth to take advantage of verticality. In this instance, we're constricting laterally and we're giving ourselves a little bit more depth. And that is going to be able to hold that 18 inches of height and that drama that's going to occur and it's gonna provide a color palette that allows us to really maximize this piece in, an, in a sort of year in, year out basis. Not just piggybacking on that floral display, but really taking advantage of the foyer color. Now, when this blooms as a reddish pink, is it going to be flattering this? We gotta think about that. Is that a moment where we pull it off display? Is that a moment where we wouldn't put this forward as its best possible presentation? Or do we potentially take out the red and the complementary and do we go with maybe a blue? Because now this is much more quiet. Let me get out of the way. Okay, much more quiet. The blue, green with the blue, suddenly we have analogous color. Suddenly we have a much more quiet composition. 
But when this does give us that verticality, and obviously if we're gonna take this plant and we're gonna shrink this down into this small pot, we're gonna get a, a far, a greatly constricted and reduced height, right? But nevertheless, we have the capacity with the constriction of lateral and the depth, we do have the capacity to aesthetically uh, hold that form, but that bloom is now going to be a moment where we really get this piece to pop. And I'm considering that and I'm saying, gosh, I like the red, I love this. I think this is amazing, okay? I think the, the Kupferman pot uh, made out of concrete with the colors that he's able to achieve is absolutely spectacular. Quality is there, quality of the piece is there, right? But then when we think about the bloom, the bloom is gonna be a real conflict, I think, because I think you're gonna kind of bounce off each other with the pinkish red and, and the more brick red, okay? We go to this, we're gonna have a quiet combination for the rest of the year, right? But when it blooms, it is going to be spectacular. Am I willing to deal with a less exciting or do I want potentially a less exciting composition and really tap into that moment of bloom as a celebratory aspect of this particular composition? Okay, let's talk about middle ground. Adding a little bit of white into there, the Heinzel Rider, right? Now this is a very, very deep blue with that minty blue, okay? To me, this feels like when we start to look at the color wheel, and we start to talk about too much separation. So if we're dealing with sort of a, 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 a minty green and we're dealing with a really saturated blue, kind of tapping into purple, these are no longer next to each other on the color wheel. They have some distance here. And this is where we start to really create kind of a conflict of color theory. Because the greater the distance is, unless we're starting to be opposite of each other, the less that they work together in a way that's aesthetically appreciable. So when we start to look at this, this really saturated blue with this kind of blue green, now being separated by two or three color blocks on the color wheel, depending on how detailed the color wheel is, starts to work in a way that is far less beautiful and appreciable than that straight blue and that minty blue green. I'm gonna say this is not a good combination for this piece and I don't think it's gonna give us much value when it flowers or in its continual display of the foyer color. And now we're starting to really dig into the nuts and bolts and the nitty gritty of the container selection, okay? Now I wanna present this Heinzer Rider one more time because I think the red and the white and I also think form here starts to create a very interesting relationship. Okay, this piece is on a diagonal. If we think about the diagonal, we have a tremendous amount of stability. These plants are gonna have verticality and now we go with lateral width. Lateral width, we go across the color wheel with that red, right? We're talking about that red here. We're talking about that minty blue here. We get a complementary color combination that will exist throughout the year. We do have some saturated blue, light accent, Hopefully, and what we would anticipate is that this might give us some form, some form of, of manner and relationship with the blooms. But even then, I think the red is the dominant force in terms of this composition, and I'm interested in the lateral as well as the vertical. Okay, so I think we're down to three options here. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, listen, this is, there's no right way. There's no right way to do Kusumo. There's no right way to create a composition. It's all of these things that we think about that we kind of try and mix and match and marry to be able to create the most aesthetically pleasing thing. And I'm gonna say, listen, as much as I love the Kupferman, I don't know that the color hue of that is necessarily hitting the complementary uh, form or the complementary, excuse me, complementary relationship with the blue-green foyer mask. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this away, okay? When I look at the Heinzel Rider, I'm gonna say, listen, I like, I like the blue. I think the blue is on point for analogous. I think the blooms would be absolutely spectacular. I don't know that the shape is necessarily right for a tremendous amount of verticality. That feels to me like a stretch, okay? The lateral form, when we start to look at the Heinzel Rider, this to me feels like, okay, now we have the red, we have the, the blue green, we have the blooms that are gonna come about and, and we've got that, that pinkish red, now all of a sudden we've got lateral, we've got color, we've got all things working for us. I'm gonna use this as my selection, all right? And I think this is gonna be quite spectacular, okay? Small planting space, no problem. Let's go about the process of creation now, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this out. Now when we start to handle succulents, again, always handling succulents from down below or underneath all of this foyer mass, right? Notice how my hands 
are working right here. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna squeeze the containers on the corner. Some people get really rough with this. I don't like to get super rough because just a little squeeze frees it from the container, okay? Now what we see here is we see some really large kind of fleshy roots that are running through the root system. Notice those big white roots here, okay? And then we have kind of this fine sort of fibrous texture that exists inside of, inside of the root system, all right? Not a big deal at all. To just come in here, I'm gonna use my bamboo chopstick, and I do like to. Some people just chop that off. I don't think that that's a very effective way to go about it because we don't really know what kind, of, what kind of support system we have in here in terms of roots until we kind of open it up. Sometimes it is nice to have some options and to be able to go ahead and utilize some of these pieces. Notice how long this piece that's supporting this is. Now again, foliar mass is soft and fleshy and water-filled, so is the root system. Very soft and fleshy and water-filled in terms of its behavior. Okay, and you can see, I gotta be careful with those big, thick roots. Okay, but here's the thing about succulents. Succulents are wonderful from the perspective that we could actually take one of these pieces, we could pull this out, we could stick that in a dry uh, uh, container of soil, and this physical piece would actually produce roots and continue to grow. Succulents are very, very durable, okay? Unlike some of our leafy species and our more temperate climate species, very capable of rooting, very capable of spreading, very prolific as long as we do not overwater them, right? And this is what makes them so ideal when we talk about plants that have that water and gourd succulent characteristic. It's what makes them so ideal for indoor containerized growth. Look at that. Really beautiful little piece attached to the root there. That's a byproduct, yeah, look at that. That's a byproduct of just the, the way that succulents spread and expand and generate root system. You see that little tiny hair root? Okay, this could be planted and it would proliferate into a full-size succulent uh, sedum if we planted that. I'll leave that here and I'll leave the, the other piece as well, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna adjust the depth. I'm gonna try to save some of the root mass so that we don't have to create or propagate a succulent from cuttings because although we say, listen, this could, this could be just planted in the, uh, you know, these pieces taken off and planted. There is going to be some failure right there. And if we have roots, we might as well use the roots because this allows this piece to continue on, right? And when we talk about this, we're saying, hey, in terms of Kusumono, it's not just about the composition. It's not just about having it. It's about the age of it. It's about the quality of it. It's about perpetuating what this piece is going to be over the course of time and really having that vision. We've already dove too deep into intentional creation right now with, w without having done any more to be taking anything that we have here for granted, okay? So I'm just gonna give this a little bit of a check and kind of start to see how much more do I need to reduce? How do I wanna handle this when I'm starting to create? And that's really interesting, isn't it? I like that red. That's very, very, uh, oh man, that's visually very, very interesting. Okay, the blue is a little bit uh, odd in the way that it engages. The lateral is super spectacular. Think about this growing 18 inches tall though. This is gonna be absolutely rock and roll, at least from my perspective, okay? Now, I don't want to, and let me show you this side. Notice that I'm still not even remotely in the wheelhouse of having this piece into the container. Now, when we talk about Kusumono creation, we can have pieces that are a little bit oversized. We can put them into a smaller container. They will adapt, they will adjust, okay? But to begin with, I wanna start off on the right foot by just getting a really nice position inside of the container, not where the surface of my, of my succulent is level with the container, but at least where a majority of the native soil and the root system that we're gonna be working with is planted and is inside of that containerized environment. It allows us to have good control of water. It allows us to start off with a plant at that level that it can only mature from there so that we're not boosting it outside of that and creating maybe or losing the opportunity for it to mature with the highest level of aesthetic. So I'm just gonna take this down, specifically focusing on the edges. I've got this really major root right here that I'm gonna to try to save. Okay, focusing on the edges because I have a contour inside of this vessel that has tapered walls to it going into the spherical shape. Okay, so I'm just kind of using my chopstick to tease away that organic soil and finding that space inside of the composition. Okay, let's see what we have here now. Okay, that's starting to feel a lot better. All right, yeah, okay. Now notice how that sits down inside of this piece. When we're starting with one of these, we wanna give every opportunity for this piece to spill over that and to really start to play with that container in a form and in a function that gives it aesthetic value, right? If we 
If we think about Kusumo and we say, I'm going to plant this like a garden plant. I'm going to plant this like a tree in a pot or a plant in a pot. I'm going to plant this straight up, right? I'm going to mound up the soil around it. It's going to grow straight up. We kind of missed, we kind of lost that opportunity to give the plant a little bit of a different direction from its standard growth habit and give it the opportunity to respond, right? So if I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about this and I'm, and I'm playing on the reduction of the root mass and I have this big thick root that I'm gonna go ahead and try to save, that means that this is gonna sit in the container at a little bit of a diagonal. Let me show you that here, okay? A little bit of a diagonal. Now this starts to create an interesting form because these pieces are gonna have to grow up. They're gonna have to grow down this and they're gonna have to grow back up. And these pieces on top, these are gonna grow up. Notice the space that we've created here. Okay, that space inside of Kusumono design is absolutely important. Negative space as well as positive space, if we're utilizing this plant to be more than a plant in a container, taking advantage of those opportunities, creating those moments, and allowing the plant to adapt to being thrown off of its standard growth habit, all of these things push this in a direction that says, hey, aesthetically, we're bucking the trend of common and we're starting to see what happens when we give the plant information and we allow it to respond. Already we've been thinking about color theory. Already we've been thinking about design. Now we're gonna push it that extra little bit to get just a little bit more out of the plant, okay? I feel pretty good with this. I'm gonna go just a little bit farther, just a little bit farther in terms of the reduction here. And as I'm doing this, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Eve's gonna be fielding those and delivering them. And if you have questions, let them rip. All right. Uh, well, I just also wanted to start off letting everybody know that we also have these Kusumona kits available in our web store right now, which make a wonderful little gift. As many of you are already involved in bonsai, you may have friends that you're trying to get into bonsai, or perhaps you'd love to give this to a partner. And then let's see, heading into questions. But first, I've got Chuck. Chuck says, some of the plants used for kusumono or shtakusa like alkaline soil. Do you ever add hydrated lime to the soil or kusumono arrangements, or is it better to just use some of the combination of akadama pumice or perlite and regular gardening soil and water with neutral or slightly acidic pH like rainwater? Yeah, that's a really good question, Chuck. So I think, you know, when we start to get into Mr. Kimura's uh, Shtakusa collection was the, still to this day the best I've ever seen. Uh, and I don't know if anybody's ever noticed if they've been to Mr. Kimura's garden, his, his Shtakusa collection. And again, you know, really kind of trying to delineate uh, Shtakusa from Kusumono is to say Shtakusa is something that is designed to be a companion to bonsai. And obviously Mr. Kimura being a bonsai practitioner and a bonsai professional, um, that, was, that was where he focused his efforts um, so when we talk about Shtakusa and Mr. Kimura's uh, Shtakusa collection specifically, um, re really, really impressive. And the, the thing about it that he used to always talk to us about was, hey, listen, bonsai is easy when you compare it to really catering to understory plants over the course of time. Some of these plants are riparian. Some of these plants demand acidic conditions. Some of these plants demand uh, alkaline conditions, right? That is all a part when we go deep into the act of Kusumono creation. And it only matters when they start to mature. In the very beginning, is a plant that prefers alkaline soil going to be completely incapable of functioning if it's presented in, a, in a, a, a neutral soil or even a slightly acidic soil? Probably not. But as that plant functions in that environment, over the course of time, it's gonna have less and less malleability or flexibility. It's gonna occupy the soil system. It's gonna to start to take on the continual onslaught of those conditions in terms of water delivery that don't suit its needs. And you'll really see it suffer over the course of time. So initially, do I think about that and do I take action on that? Not initially, but if you're going to cultivate kusumono that have those kind of nuances over the course of time, you will have to consider them. Now, this is where succulents are really, really ideal or plants that have a succulent characteristic are ideal. Typically, they have a very low level of nuanced care requirement. They like to stay drier as opposed to wetter. Uh, they like bright light as opposed to dark light, but all of these sedums are full sun to partial shade 
which lend themselves to the indoor environment as well as the, uh, the outdoor environment. Obviously, a brighter indoor environment is going to be necessary, but definitely something that doesn't demand we water it every day, that definitely needs to dry out between waterings. It gives us some flexibility and some malleability, and pH-wise, they're very, very adaptive to a variety of pHs. So definitely kind of a, a genre, if you will, that allows us a tremendous amount of flexibility. But certainly over the course of time, you are going to have to adapt to the needs of your kusumono, and it can be quite complex when you get into that world. All right, up next, I got another question from Chuck. He's saying that they were thumbing through some cocoa food books and noticed that a lot of the shtakusa used selanginella. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, some with bronzy colored fronds that look really cool in autumn slash winter compositions. Do you like using selanginella for kusumono and shtakusa? And if so, which species do you prefer? Um... I do like using it. There's kind of a, a, a generic variety that I think is typical of, of the kusumono or the shitakusa that you see in Japan. It's very vigorous. It's very prolific, naturally seeding and occurring. Um, and I don't know what variety that is necessarily, uh, but very, very common and something that we have it in our bonsai containers here. I have it in kusumono here as well. Um, really, really nice, but, but again, very vigorous. And a lot of the times when we start to talk about understory plants, right, we're not talking about necessarily an understory plant, although we could be talking about it. And a lot of people love the, the production or the pursuit of orchids. orchids. Orchids could be treated as kusumono. They absolutely could be treated as kusumono. doesn't mean they should be or have to be, but they could be. There's an opportunity there for an orchid to be a kusumono or treat it as a kusumono, okay? Let me, just, uh, let me just pause for a minute. I'm gonna say this, okay? When we're, when we're preparing our kusumono containers, we've gotta create a condition in which the soil does not leave the container. We have a drainage screen, we've got aluminum that allows us to secure that drainage screen into the bottom of the hole. Uh, and, and for this particular piece, being on angle, I definitely want to try and secure the piece into the container. So what I've done is I've created some aluminum tie downs. Not every container and not every composition is gonna require that it be tied into the container. But again, because we're putting a big plant in a small pot, because it's gonna be vertically tall and have a lot of leverage over the course of time, I am going to secure this root system into this physical container. So this is my tie down wire that I've utilized a piece of bamboo on the bottom. Just a small little bridge that we've tied to here. Okay, notice I've wrapped the wire around it. It's a, it's a nice stopper. There's not two holes, there's only one. This is how we handle that one hole scenario, okay? So now that I've got that, when we talk about the soil system for Kusumono, so many different soils. If we look at the native soil, or excuse me, the nursery soil that exists around this particular piece, this is a very, very heavy organic soil. Right? And when we start to look at this, you say, well, organic soil holds a lot of water. This is uh, uh, probably 70, 80% organic. And then I can see some perlite or pumice in here that's giving us a little bit of aggregate presence. Um, but when we look at that 70 or 80% organic soil, we start to say, gosh, that's a big time water holding component. Definitely, definitely holds a lot of water, which means if it holds a lot of water, you water it and you don't have to water it again for several, several weeks, maybe even up to a few months, right? But when we move it into a kusumono container, smaller container constriction, we could go with that organic soil. To be sure, we could go with it. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use akadama, which is, which is standard for our bonsai trees. I also find it to be very, very functional for our kusumono. Now, in terms of my akadama, I'm going to use a finer grade of akadama. We've been taking out the 1 16th. I definitely want the 1 16th particle size up to that 1 quarter. You may even take out the 1 quarter and just have the 1 16th to 1 8th as your Akadama size if you're going to use Akadama, in fact, for your Kusumono composition, okay? I'm just gonna give a little bit on the bottom here. I'm gonna punch a little bit of a hole right through the middle of this composition. Let's see if I can get that through. Okay, and this hole is gonna be where my tie-down wire goes through. Okay, nothing, nothing, nothing serious, right? I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to anchor this piece in. Okay, we'll get that wire up and through. Boom, boom, okay. Have my little bit of Akadama. Let me give a little bit more. And I'm gonna seat this piece with that orientation that we were working with, compensating for that very thick root. I'm gonna seat this piece and I'm just gonna settle it in. 
Okay, just settling it in, getting the right planting position, having it drape over that just the way that we want it, right? Nothing really serious about the planting of Kusumono. They have far more flexibility. We don't have to be as insistent of occupying the airspaces. The chopsticking or the introduction of soil into Kusumono, much, much, much lower lift and much less effort than we typically would expect, okay? So I'm just getting that piece put into that container and I'm gonna use a little bit of a bridge, right? And again, if you have an upright piece, if you have a deeper container, securing these pieces into the container, not necessarily as big of an issue, but when we start to talk about trying to create something that's gonna have verticality, that means we're gonna have a lot of weight. Sedum is, again, as a succulent, very soft, very, very water engorged kind of fleshy piece. It's nice to have that anchor and nice to have things solidified so when we get that verticality, we don't have the piece falling over, we don't have it falling out of the container, etc. Okay, now we're anchored in. We've got our soil underneath the piece. Now we can go about introducing soil around it very lightly, nothing too intense, and the roots, again, we still understand these pieces are very delicate, easily broken, so we want to be handling our kusumono very, very carefully, right? Notice that I'm not approaching in any way my kusumono by crashing into it. If we're aggressive with kusumono and we're aggressive with the succulent characteristics that exist inside of this, we're gonna have this piece completely laid out and broken down. Not that it would die, very durable, but then we don't get the, the form to start off on the right foot, okay? I'm gonna take a very nice thin chopstick and I'm just gonna introduce the soil into these spaces. Now, whether you're using a garden soil or whether you're using an akadama or a more aggregate soil, we still need to make sure that we have good contact of soil to the physical roots of the succulent piece that we're putting into our kusumono composition. The reason for that, if we don't have good soil contact, the lack of soil and the lack of content, contact is gonna create an oxygen rich environment that doesn't have the ability to keep the root hydrated over the course of time and that root will eventually die and rot and that's a real problem, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna introduce this soil, open it up for questions again and we'll finish this off once I've got all the spaces filled. All right, let's see. Up next, we've got a question from Bentley. Uh, Bentley says, um, you mentioned a plant that you're absolutely obsessed with. It's a flower of some sort. He can't remember the name of it. Do you know it by chance? Uh, Epimedium. Epimedium. All right, there it is, Bentley. Uh, up next, we've got Sarah. Uh, Sarah posed this question to the chat, but I thought it was interesting, and I thought I'd present it to everyone. Why are there no pink or magenta pots? Or at least it seems like there's very few when it comes to <laughs> ceramics. Well, uh, why are there no pink or magenta pots? I don't know. Why are there not many red pots? You know, ultimately, you don't see mm -hmm. a lot of those big, bold colors in, in the bonsai practice. Probably some perpetuation of the desire to be understated and put the focus on the tree. Because when we start hammering with really big, bold colors in the, in the pursuit of bonsai, oftentimes the container can take away the attention from the actual tree itself. <laughs> And in the Japanese aesthetic of bonsai, right, which is where the, where, where, where the word bonsai and where a lot of our notions about these tiny trees in a containerized uh, environment come from, that kind of bold, really big, loud display is counter to the intention of the Japanese approach. It's not to say that there isn't potentially a space or room for the utilization of a bolder color in the containerized environment. It's just to say that tip, where we're at now and with the repetition of things that we might not necessarily understand or know, know the intention behind, there are still some question marks or areas that have not been addressed or explored. All right, uh, up next I've got Charlie. Charlie wants to know, uh, can you leave it on long-term like moss or do you only put it in for show? I think he's talking about uh, adding understory perhaps to a bonsai uh, pot itself. Ah, so. I'm not planting this inside of the bonsai container, although we have talked in recent times about arid environments, that moss is a very difficult thing to cultivate on the surface of the soil in bonsai compositions. Wood succulents potentially be a way that we can protect that surface, have a very shallow rooted, minimal water utilizing uh, component that's not competing with the tree in the containerized and confined environment. And my feeling is, yeah, we absolutely could. Uh, utilize succulents in arid environments to be a cover 
that protects the structure of the Akadama, doesn't compete with the tree for resource and nutrient water uptake, etc. Um, and there are trees at Mirai that definitely have succulents inside of them, not because I planted them there, but because of the succulents we have in the garden, self-seeded over the course of time, are thriving in the more arid containers that we have, and really seem to not take away from the tree and in fact contribute to the composition, right? But when we're talking about this specific purpose, this is to create a standalone piece of a singular uh, pea tree, or excuse me, a singular plant inside of a container. And that, that is a standalone, the, the succulent itself is the art form at that point in time, okay? I've got the, the, the spaces occupied, very, very effortless, right? Light, I don't wanna crush the Akadama, I don't wanna pack all of that organic matter if we're using more of a garden soil 70% uh, organic 30% aggregate, really, really nice uh, way. We can take, you know, wh whether you're talking about black gold as, as sort of a composted uh, garden soil that we typically use for potted plants, and we add a little bit of pumice, a little bit of perlite to it just to dilute it and give it some more oxygen and a little bit more structure. That's a great, that's a great succulent medium. That's a great kusamono medium in general. I know Young Cho uses something uh, of an organic amended slightly in her compositions. Because we have Akadama and I don't have uh, any of that other soil, I just thought I'll just use Akadama, right? It's, it's literally that free in terms of how we go about the treatment and what changes is how we water the piece, right? So if I'm gonna be using Akadama, which is aggregate and has a little bit more of a larger structure, greater oxygen space, I'm gonna have to water a little bit more frequently. If we're using a finer organic medium, we can water a little bit less frequently. Frequently for this piece is gonna be two, two, two times a week, roughly. Two times a week, this piece will thrive. If we're using a finer, more organic medium, maybe once a week or maybe even once every other week is all that it will take in order to be able to sustain these water conductive, water containing uh, plants that have this succulent characteristic, okay? Now, because this is on angle, if this weren't on angle, I could top dress this with some moss uh, and just water it in and call it good and let it do its thing, okay? But because it's on an angle, I know that my soil over the course of time is gonna wash away. And this is where I like to come back and I like to just treat with a thin layer of sphagnum. Nothing, again, nothing serious, nothing uh, overly done. This isn't the same as bonsai in terms of the necessity to merge the soil and the sphagnum environment, okay? This is just a way to sustain and hold the soil from washing away on the diagonal environment, as well as to aesthetically merge this sort of inflated root system that we're putting into a much smaller part, pot to really enjoy the proportional play that we're creating in Kusumono and to be able to sustain this piece in this reduced environment that the root system is being moved into. Okay, so I'm just gonna fit question. this in, making sure I get that sphagnum dropping just below the rim there. Notice how I'm just making sure I'm dropping below the rim. I pull the soil away uh, enough that I have the space for the sphagnum to occupy that surface. I'm gonna drop that just below the rim so that it's locked in. And I'm gonna call it good at this point in time. I don't need to do any more succulents, very effortless in terms of overworking a succulent is far worse than underworking a succulent, okay? I don't wanna sit here and overly chopstick. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna fuss with a succulent. I don't wanna touch it a lot. I don't wanna overwater it a lot. These are low maintenance plants that allow us to really just enjoy the kind of compositional benefits that we achieve through considering. And in this moment, considering what? Considering color. Considering color in terms of how is that going to reflect the quality and characteristic of that material in the composition over time. Of course, when we consider color, we also consider height, we also consider uh, the, the shape of the container, et cetera. But color was really the driving force of this conversation, okay? Now I'm gonna pull out another piece. I'm gonna to start to get some container options put together. I'm gonna to open it up to questions in the, in the interim. Go ahead, Eve, I'm gonna, let, let me prepare for the next one. What's that? Cool. You want to rotate right. here? Up next. How about there? How about there? Yeah. How about that? There's that beauty shot. How you like Ooh. me now? Okay. <laughs> uh, up next, I got a question from Mary Ann. She says, I normally use cactus soil mix when working with succulents. Are sedums more tolerant of a regular planting mix? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And even when you go to major succulent or when you go to, um, you know, nurseries in, in Mediterranean environments that have a very, um, that have a very commonly uh, practiced 
sort of succulent inventory, a lot of them use really heavy organic mediums, which has always shocked me when you're like, okay, well, succulents really like dryness, and yet this is a heavily water retentive medium. The way that they get away with that is they just don't water it nearly as much, and that's where they strike that middle ground. Ultimately, succulents could be grown in straight gravel if you wanted to. And this is where at Mirai, succulent pieces from the bonsai container, if they get broken off and they fall in the gravel, take root on their own. That's literally how durable they are. Because of the water content, they eventually form a skin over the broken part. From the skin, you get root formation, and they really thrive in that kind of environment. You could grow them in straight gravel. So it is, it is an aggregate it is an aggregate minded plant in terms of having a diversity, but that organic medium is what allows you to water less, especially if you're gonna be taking them indoors. Bright spot indoors, organic medium, 70% organic, 30% aggregate, that pumice or that perlite addition to some of that standard potted plant medium, and all of a sudden you can get away with a once every sort of 10 days, two week watering time frame over the course of spring, summer, and fall. Winter time, maybe once a month is all that, you, that it's gonna take. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna set this off to the side here and I'm gonna pull this in, the Semper Vivum, uh, Semper Vivum, yeah. Okay, Semper Vivum, Pekingese, two inches tall. Sun departs shade. Okay, I love this, I love these things. Now, I've got one that's kind of green uh, with a little bit of like a, a burgundy hue and then I've got one that's just like super, super uh, fire, red, burgundy, maroon. This one's called, uh, Caucasicum, Caucasicum. Rosy pink flowers in late summer, fall, two inches. This one's Pekingese. This is a rose colored flower, June and July, uh, two inches tall. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go with the green because I, I think the green, you know, we talked about blue green here. Just straight green with a little bit of burgundy creates an interesting opportunity, all right? And when I start to look at this kind of really, really arid, and this is even, you know, the sedum here is gonna need a little bit of moisture. When we talk, start to talk about the Semper Vivum or the hens and chicks, they can tolerate moisture, but they can tolerate a significant amount of dryness. Now notice what happens as I take that out of the container. You see that these are all supported by that containerized environment and they're all existing on their own stems. And this is really where we start to talk about age amassing in these plants that have this sort of categorization of succulent because these pieces will continue to elongate. Each one of these could be separated, could be planted or stuck into uh, on the surface of, a, a, of a, a soil medium, and it would grow and create its own colony of plants. They, they self-divide, they self-root, they take care of their own thing. But I wanna keep these. I want these pieces hanging off of this container, and this is where we can use this habit to kind of overflow, to really mound up and amass some sort of texture and contour and overflow. And this is where we can start to insinuate environment. This is where we could say, listen, a Jonathan Cross Cusimono piece made in the desert of Joshua Tree, and I'm gonna put this ultimately arid, kind of odd creeping form that also has this mounding habit on this very shallow surface, and I'm gonna call it good. That is what I want, that is what I'm gonna create. Okay, that is an opportunity, and this lighter color is a really interesting way to consider that. Now let's start to look at what happens when we go dark and what happens when we start to change the form and texture, right? Do these pieces matter? Or what happens when we go even farther and we talk about really, really interesting textures? What about the Heinzel Rider with that kind of cubist-like marshmallow, I don't know what you call it. That's kind of fascinating. Or what if we go in a completely different direction and what if we go super elegant? What if we talk about this really spiky textured foliar mass and we go with a much smoother, much, much smoother kind of elongated container? Something really different, really interesting. Naturally, if we're thinking contextual, arid plant, arid container, right? But that's obvious and it's not to say it's bad. That might be where we go. But when we start to think about this texture as a big discussion. Do we go opposite in textures? Rough, spiky, sharp, smooth, right? Smooth, and we could go even smoother. What if we came here? What if we just went with a, a round piece, okay? Round versus spiky. Completely different, right? This is interesting. Isn't that interesting? Now there's some informality 
There's some color play that does represent environment to a degree. This is a me and Ramondi piece. This is Matias and his partner kind of going outside of their standard practice. I find this to be radically interesting. Just a real shallow, again, the beauty of succulents is they don't need a big container. If you go to the garden center, if you go to a succulent uh, nursery, this has happened to me. I go to succulent nurseries in Los Angeles, and I say, how much can I trim these roots? And they say, ah, you know, 30 40% should be safe. Well, in bonsai, we're talking 50 60% is the bare minimum, right? And so we know we're going to put this into a very small, confined environment, and that's where we get all of the visual interest to occur. The difference between kusumono and a potted plant. Right? So when I start to look at this, I think, wow, putting this piece that has so much texture, that has so much uh, contour to it, into this very symmetrical, and I would say very smooth vessel, is an interesting contrast to what you would typically expect. Not saying that it's not practiced. There's a lot of people, uh, Young Cho always kind of blows my mind with her combinations of plants and containers as I think a real standout in the Kusumono practice in North America. Uh, you know, but playing with these different acts of design to elevate the level of the understory plant that we're utilizing, I think this is where the fun is, okay? I, I think this, this round container is nice. I'm curious what you think though, and let me just give you options and then I need your feedback because I want to create a composition where we collaborate tonight. Okay, so I'm going to do the, the Jonathan Cross here. Let me just kind of show you what that's going to look like. Feels appropriate to me. Feels very, very appropriate to me, right? I think that's, I think it's nice. I think it is understandable. Uh, I think the dark color with the bright green is, is vibrant. But notice that this is sharp right? Sharp and, and aggressive. And this is sharp and aggressive. Okay, there's, there's continuity of design there. That's interesting. Okay, let me go ahead and switch this. All right. I'm going to put the blonde uh, Jonathan Cross here. Sorry, the darker Jonathan Cross number one. Okay, blonde Jonathan Cross here. Okay, take a look at that. Now, I think the green stands out a lot more. Again, if we're talking texture, as a way to change the utilization of this, this is sharp again, very, very sharp, very, very angular has continuity with the form of this plant, all right? Color is a little different, lighter color, maybe a little more desert vibe, maybe the burgundy pops a little bit more, okay? Let's go here. Let's take a look at this. I think this has a fascinating form. This is basically just a folded piece of clay. Now here, we start to get into a little bit more rounded form. Very, still very organic, but notice that we have some sharp edges, but this contour right here, the folded clay, let me just show you this. Okay, this is something Jonathan's been experimenting with. I think this is just radical and really fascinating. There's no drain holes, which means I would have to really adjust my watering appropriately so that I didn't overwater, right? I, th I don't think a large amount of water is going to pool in there, but there will be some water that, that stays there, and there are ways that we can offset that. That is an interesting combination. I like that, okay? Let me go with the Heinzel Rider, okay? The marshmallow, boom. Now here I think we have a real, a real big conversation about texture and sort of the, 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 the shape or the form of this in these little blocks kind of being reflected in the blocks here. Is it too, is it too uh, analogous? Is it too consistent? Does it take away the unique form of the Sempervivum by utilizing a piece that has virtually the same exact sort of structure to it or not? I don't know, you tell me. Okay, let me give you two more, two more, all right? This is too many options for you, I know, but let's just go deep if we're gonna do it. Okay, here's a now tokutake. I like the long slender pot. I think the long slender pot has a lot of merit. This allows us to play with space. It allows us to maybe offset this to one side. Maybe we put a little bit of gravel in this side to top off this piece so that we have the Sempervivum over here and we've got a little bit of negative space and gravel in the composition here. That could be really spectacular. That could be a way to utilize this elongated form, have a little bit of seamless smooth to it and still take advantage of the fact that, it, that, that the ceramic itself is telling a part of the story, okay? And then the me and Ramondi. Uh, round form. I think this piece has, in my mind, a complementary, smooth, contrasting with jagged, rough, sharp, and pointed. <sighs> it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to deny the merit of this. And, and, and this is where your, your subjective preference comes in. Because 
If you're empowered with the knowledge of how we utilize these succulents and the care that goes into it and the soil and the manner in which we go about this process, then you get to select which of these meets your desire to create that context or just your visual preference. Which one do you like that you're gonna look at and be like, that's freaking awesome, that's awesome. Looks like a scene from the desert, I love the contrast of the textures. I love the, 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 the consistency of the textures. You get to play with all of the options that allow you to enjoy this plant on that next level, right? So I'm gonna open it up to questions. I'm gonna start to reduce this root mass because in all of these, the root mass needs to be a little bit more shallow. And then I wanna know which container are we using for this piece? Go ahead, Eve. All right. Well, I'll let you know already that the chat is very split over which pot, which uh, uh, ceramic I'm they I'm sure. Like the I, I probably gave one. too many options. Yeah, but yeah. That's what that's what they're saying. Lots of options. I mean, I'll go ahead. I'll state my favorite. I do like the J cross dark one. That's the fold over of the rock. That one is, is really Yeah, that uh, was interesting, great. right? Yes. We're calling it that the taco in the chat. Oh, the taco. So like the rock the taco. taco. Yep. Nice. Rock taco. Um, I got a question from Treebeard Steve. Actually, I'll come back to that one in a little bit. Uh, question from Kevin Ferris. Uh, with Kusumono, as an application and in the theory of it, is it best to use native plants to the area you are located? Um, well, I think that's the beauty of Kusumono because they're smaller, because they're not a significant financial investment unless you're going with like some rare and unusual plant. You know, like bonsai, if you're gonna swim against uh, the current and you're gonna get plants that, uh, that are not adapted to your environment, you, you're gonna, the, the tree's gonna be driving the boat and you're gonna have to work really hard to, even to get it to survive, let alone to perform in a way that maximizes it as a bonsai. For Kusumono, you have uh, number one, a lower price point, number two, a, a, a much more highly mobile and adjustable composition. I can take the succulent inside if it's winter time, right? And it's not a big deal, right? This is, this is effortless for me to carry. I, I think native plants are amazing. I think you should have them uh, as, uh, and, and explore the native plant palette in the creation of Kusumono. But I also think you have the freedom Right, and Kusumono is free. Kusumono is playful. It's not as heavy as bonsai typically can be when we pursue bonsai on that highest level. It's not that. It's not as um, constricting. It doesn't demand as much. We still need to treat it with respect. We still need to understand how to water, how to technically apply, uh, you know, the process of repotting and care to the plant, um, and how and what weather conditions it can tolerate but we don't have to be so concerned and so knowledgeable as bonsai demands that we be. And this is where Kusumono becomes super free-spirited, right? It's, it's about what you want. It's about what makes it look good to your preference. And it's about exploring those plants that you can create the environment where they can thrive. Um, let's see, coming back to, oh, uh, Rafi is curious if you could bring back the Aaron Kupferman concrete, uh, option ah, that you had up yeah, on me, the first round. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, here's the Aaron Kupferman, which is, which is pretty spicy. I'm not going to lie. Pretty That's, spicy. It is an interesting combination because you've got so much texture in that, in that plant and that yeah, that, and uh, I, ceramic is so smooth. Yeah, interesting. That is an interesting suggestion. I think it's, you know, I would want like, and here's the other thing to talk about. This is a, this is a very small, what, six inch pot, maybe, maybe four inch pot, succulent composition. Okay, I could get two or three of these pieces into this Aaron Kupferman, and I could utilize those to fill it up immediate, immediately and be super immediately gratifying. No problem. You know, it would go from $6 to $18 to create this composition. No problem, right? Or I can plant this piece offset in this container and I can allow it to occupy the container over the course of time. And this is the interesting thing because if I offset this here and I have this space here, I can use this space, okay? I could plant uh, a, a multi-species composition, but more than that, I can use this space as a design element, and that's where I think utilizing textures and colors and aggregates to be able to piggyback on the, the context of the plant, where it comes from, where it would naturally exist, or the design elements that we're focusing on inside of the composition creates options, okay? I think the Aaron Kupferman is nice. If I'm gonna use this though, I'm gonna go get three or four of these, and I'm gonna put them in here with this big, beautiful display, but I love it. That's nice, Rafi. All right. Uh, next. Tell me what we're doing, Eve. Tell me what we're doing. Sorry, what? Which container are we using? 
Oh, which which one are we doing? Um, well, let's see. We've I'm got leaning on you for this. I mean, I got I have my preference, oh my and I'll tell you my preference <laughs> once we're all finished. Okay. Okay, well, so far I, I did get a couple more votes for the Rock Taco, but I did hype it, so perhaps that's why. Uh, please, in the chat, let me know if you are anti-Rock Taco. <laughs> the Rock then, the rock, the rock Taco is the dominant one. I'm seeing Taco, 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 rectangular long one. Okay, we've got... We've got Ooh, nice. I like the rectangular one. long Thank you for that. Thank you for, thank, thank you for validating that because that was, I went out on a limb. Uh, <laughs> I think the elongated rectangular one is spectacular. I'm going to say the marshmallow... Unless anybody out there is just like dead set on the marshmallow, I'm gonna say it's too similar to me form wise, and I think the Semper Vivum loses some of the value. Okay, so I'm gonna do away with the marshmallow. Sarah actually made a good comment about that one, and she said that some tall grasses would look really good in that marshmallow. I think tall grasses could so look short. good in the marshmallow. I think something that has a linear form to break up all of that small sort of, you know, fractured form would be really interesting if we're talking about form being the component of the composition. Okay, what about the flat Jonathan crosses? We like the rock taco. We like the elongated rectangle. Were there any votes for these pieces? Let's see. Um, round, shallow, brown. Let's see. Haven't seen anything yet. Okay. All right. These go away. Just haven't, haven't seen. If, yeah. if, if they haven't spoken yet, forever hold your peace. Okay. What about the round <laughs> me and Ramondi? There are, uh, let's see. I do think I got one person that said that they did like the round. I got two people saying they like the me and Ramondi, I believe, in the chat. Not mm -hmm. too many votes, but. Okay. All right. So basically, the rock taco is dominating, right? It is. There's a, people are saying that it would look really nice if some of the um, some of the plant came out through the front. So not yeah. only came out over the top, but came out. Got through it. The front Let's there. do it. Okay. Here we go. I am I am remiss to put the rectangular uh, uh, now Tokutaki down because I I liked it. I liked it a lot. Okay. Here we go. So. <laughs> This is going to be a, a, a planting, doesn't have a tie down, doesn't have a drain hole. I don't need screen for this, uh, and I don't need a tie down wire. As a result, I have to recognize immediately that when I water this with a succulent in it, I have to get water out of it. So just having some way, or, you know, if, if I understand, I'm going to water this, I'm just going to tilt it up on an angle to allow the water to run out of it after I hydrate it. That's enough. And to recognize that because there's no drainage hole, we're going to water this less, and we do have the responsibility of making sure that we get the excess water out of it is the only way that this plant is going to survive in a container without a drain hole, right? Now, this is a, uh, obviously, Jonathan has created kind of a seamless flow of water. He's good about the horticulture and creating. Most of the pieces that he originally created were designed for cactus. This is obviously a branching out of his, of his approach that now kind of conforms to the Kusumono uh, and opens the door for that. Okay, to also offset this Simpervivan having wet feet, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use a coarser grain of Akadama. This is our aeration layer in the practice of bonsai, one half to one quarter inch, right? Just a little bit of a bigger, kind of larger granular uh, structure. And what that does is that allows us to have sort of that really uh, uh, high quantity of water sitting above where the roots are actually gonna be facilitated to grow. Now I'm gonna cover the entire bottom of this with soil because I want there to be uh, soil between the, the, the bottom root structure of the Sempervivin and the, con and the container. But I'm gonna pull a lot of that out after we've planted it. Now, we have to decide, are we gonna put this piece in the wide open spot, or are we gonna try to cram this into the tightest possible location that it will fit inside of the taco? Either way, when we're creating Kusumono, the last thing that we wanna do is put the piece right in the center. If you dead center a Kusumono, you've kind of lost the opportunity to really push into a more aged re representation in asymmetrical form. And when you look at it, the symmetry, if you create symmetry in Kusumono, you've put a, pot, uh, a plant in a pot and that's all that you've done, okay? So think about, try to pull that, try to pull that nuance, try to pull that character and quality and utilize that negative space inside of the container as a point of value, right? The asymmetry, the offset, the lopsided distribution of weight, et cetera, these are all the ways that you pull this natural plant response to the way that you offset that symmetrical growth habit and you get wonderful magic as a result. The plant has to respond, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this piece 
and I'm really gonna constrict, because I'm dealing with a highly organic medium, I'm really gonna constrict the root mass into this tightest possible location. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this all the way to the end here, and my goal in bringing it to the end, and I have to be very, very delicate, my goal in bringing it to the end here is that all of this spills Now out. watch carefully, because I have that soil underneath it, but I'm not nearly as seated as I wanna be. I'm gonna come back in here, and I'm gonna use my bamboo chopstick to just come inside of that and see how I can wedge my chopstick in there and I can push that root system down and into the containerized environment and just create that really nice kind of edge and see how that sunk that down, okay? I can do the same thing on this side and I'm just pulling these up, being very, very delicate, getting my chopstick in there and just setting that piece down and in to the actual containerized environment, okay? In doing so, I can go ahead and I can reseat some of these pieces just so that I make sure that I don't lose them. They're all attached by those stems. I want those stems to stay in place, okay? And this is where we see now, we have good solid contact with the root mass. We've pushed it down onto the top of that Akadama. I'm gonna fill from this backside, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna plug this with just a little bit of sphagnum moss, just to occupy those cracks and spaces and to make sure that when I start to add soil to the other side of this, that I don't completely and totally uh, blow out this end of it by pushing soil out and kind of defeat the purpose, okay? So I'm just gonna add a little bit. Now again, this isn't tied in, low slung, this isn't gonna get tall, okay? Now have the opportunity to go ahead and utilize this for everything that it has to offer, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and slide the sides of this root mass down. I'm gonna make sure that I've kind of compressed here. And now I can take this and I can turn this up. The, the other advantage when we start to deal with Kusumono is it's light, it's small, and we can reorient things to kind of fit our needs, all right? Now I'm gonna try to stay off of mixing the really big, thick aggregate surface on the bottom. I don't want to integrate that into the rest of this composition. I wanna keep that separate so that that's where the water sits. So I'm just working just above that in the finer pieces just to get that sort of uh, space between the bottom of the root mass and the container filled. And then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna pull out all of that soil, okay? I'm gonna pull out all of the soil that is not immediately in contact with the roots right now, okay? Nothing, nothing complex. Creating it and giving myself, because we're dealing with succulents here, low water requirement plants, giving myself the space to see the physical container, especially when we start to utilize a container like a Jonathan Cross that has a lot of natural uh, uh, texture, that has a lot of artistic merit in what he creates. I don't want to try and fill this container up. In fact, I wanna try and occupy the smallest amount of the container possible to the degree that I can still have success with the plant that I've put in it. And again, when we're dealing with succulents, you don't need to have a tremendous amount of space in the succulent environment. In fact, constricting succulents and reducing the amount of water that sits around them in the containerized environment is gonna help them thrive over the course of time, okay? So I'm just gonna plug that piece right there and show the texture of that container. Now I have, inside of this, I have some pieces that are clearly kind of without the support of a container flopping around a little bit. I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pin these pieces in. I'm gonna put a little piece down below it. I'm gonna carry it up over the top of it. Okay, and I'm gonna secure that piece where I want that piece to exist, okay? And in doing so, I know that that's gonna take root and that's gonna solidify itself right there and give rise to future, oop, future pieces of ramifiable, let me get a longer piece here, future pieces of ramifiable growth in the succulent expansion. Okay, now you might be saying, well, why don't you let that hang? A lot of times when we let these pieces flop, on Sempervivum specifically, they flop over, they eventually will rot and fall off. And I don't wanna lose these pieces. These are valuable pieces to the composition. So I wanna be careful to keep as many of these pieces that I find to be of value as possible. And when I orient them upwards, they can conduct themselves as they physiologically should. And that will allow them to expand with a healthy orientation for the new pieces that are flowing out of the composition. Just embed that guy right. there. That piece uh, there might have a chance. You. We'll see, we're gonna leave it as is. I got one more here. 
okay? Just kind of shoring up the structure of the sempervivum to be able to establish itself as a succulent piece. I got some questions for you, are you ready? Yeah, hang on, let's just take a look at this and see what we think. Let me turn it. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna offer a variety of different, uh, different presentations of the front. Blast me into Philip's camera, Josh. Okay, so here's one, there's the taco. I'm gonna come around to the end here. There's the end. Notice we're kind of overflowing here. Okay, I think this is when we start to get into the wheelhouse. I love that piece hanging over. And then I think that's, I think that's kind of your money shot right there. Right, and again, we could doctor this up with some sort of aggregate, maybe some sort of gravel or uh, finer sifted lava or pumice or sand, right? So many different ways, or we could leave it just like this. Question from Sean says they live in Bend, Oregon, where they have snowy winters. Do succulents and other kusumono need to be under grow lights in the winter? No, no, they don't need to be under grow lights. They need a bright window, preferably a bright south-facing window in the northern hemisphere, bright north-facing window in the southern hemisphere over the winter season. And once temperatures get above freezing, we move them back outside. Shady location in the beginning because they're not adapted to external conditions. But as they adapt and as they adjust over a few weeks and uh, up to you know four or six weeks, then we start moving them into the sun for varieties that like sun. Now here's where kusumono cultivation, like if I just take these pieces that I've just created and I stick them outside uh, in full sun, are they going to thrive? Only if they've come out of full sun. And honestly, after we create a kusumono composition, very, very wise to keep it in morning sun, afternoon shade, or to keep it in a little bit of, of dappled sunlight for the first few weeks. Let the plant establish, let the plant get its feet underneath it before we move full sun plants back into full sun, right? But for the most part, if we have plants that are established, their root system is established, they have a relationship with their containerized environment, a few weeks to adapt from the indoor to the outdoor, and then we can start integrating them into more and more full sun as temperatures ramp up over the spring season. And that's really the ideal uh, way that we can handle kusumono, okay? All right, I got one more. What time is it, Eve? We are at 7.33. 7.30. I got one more composition in me. And I want to pull this up because now I want to talk about just kind of a unique piece and which, which of, the, of the, the succulents that we have left would we put in this piece. So far, we've been starting with the succulent and we've been pairing the succulent with the container. Now we're starting with a container and we're going to pick the succulent that best suits or best fits that container. Okay, and when I look at a vertical piece, when I look at a vertical container, and this just starts to talk about container purchase or container acquisition and, and, and what makes it suitable for Kusumono. When I look at a highly vertical piece that has a lot of height, more height than it has width, I don't like or I don't find it necessarily as agreeable to put a vertical element into that composition, right? To have a big deep container and then have some big vertical grass, right? That, that's really challenging aesthetically. To have a tall container and to now have a big grass, uh, you know, like maybe, maybe, right? But that, that's almost like, um, like floral display at that point in time. It, it, it's, it's sort of a mismatch or maybe it's a duplicity of that characteristic of height, right? So if I'm using this tall container, my mind does typically, and again, preference is all you. You make the decision, but I'm thinking, all right, I've got verticality, let's go lateral or let's go low or let's overhang this piece, right? So as I'm kind of looking at all of these different pieces that we have here, I'm thinking about that. Now I have some pieces that are vertical. I'm gonna throw these in so that we can see. And Philip, if you just wanna be, if you can just capture the options that we have here. And I'm gonna put the container front and center. Okay, let's see what I can do here. Okay, I'm gonna show these one at a time. All right, here's the verticality on this. That feels challenging to me. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, even if you want that, I'm not gonna do that, okay? I love this plant, Della Sperma. 
Okay, this is, this is beautiful in terms of the pink blossoms that come out very, very thick and succulent. And look at it hang. Look at it already hanging, okay? Really, the pink with the, with the, the almost, um, you know, kind of china effect of that white and blue is really stunning. Okay, that's interesting. I love, I love, love, love the rough texture of this piece. This is a, another sedum. This is sedum plurical. Uh, island, let me see here. Island of Sock. Saka Hillen, Island of Saka Hillen. Wow, that's intense. Okay, it's got a rosy peak blossom. Same as this, it's gonna have a similar blossom to that. But look at the texture and look at the presence of the lines, the linear stems of this piece. I think this creates a really compelling composition. Okay, here's the larger size of the Semper Vivum. Okay, now we're talking about, in terms of this, this is Ms. Giuseppe, Semper Vivum, Ms. Giuseppe. This is hens and chicks in their purest form. A little bit of burgundy uh, tip to it, which is a, a hybridized form of the hens and chicks. I could see this being really radical, expanding outside of this. Maybe a little bit forced though, okay? We again have the smaller Semper Vivum. This is a, a, a more dwarf uh, cultivar of what we are working with in the, in the rock taco, okay? And then we've got this sedum, and this, uh, let's see here, four inches. I'm guessing that this is gonna be a little bit taller than this. A Little bit of verticality, Again, some red in the floral display, but dealing with an unusual ceramic like this, what should we put in it to maximize its quality, okay? I'm gonna throw out um, these pieces, right? And I would love to get your feedback of what you would like to see in this, knowing that that's a vertical piece. I'll open it up to questions while you give Eve some feedback. All right, I'm and I'll prepare to hear the your container. feedback, folks. Uh, in the meantime, Chuck says, what role does surface dressing play in Kusumono and Shitakusa? Does all exposed soil need to be covered with moss when exhibited, as it is usually the case for bonsai? Uh, you know, if we're going to, and, and if we're referencing um, Shitakusa display in bonsai, then yeah, you would not be showing soil. I think... When you talk about displaying Kusumono as a standalone piece, right? And if you talk, if you look at uh, Italy, Austria, some of the European countries and the level that they've taken Kusumono to, they've almost made it their own thing. Um, and there's tremendous age on these plants and there's just a fantastic level of artistry, creativity, and craftsmanship that goes into the generation of, of these Kusumono compositions. Um, there, the age that's on those high level pieces has, you know, initially when we create it, we moss, we sphagnum, we do those things. As the plant naturalizes, ages, fills up that container, spills over the edges, it takes care of all of that. Moss forms and grows naturally with the water requirements, or maybe we start to see the aggregate surface uh, become the predominant surface that, that we witness over that drier, more arid uh, environment as the organic shrinks and sort of recedes in the watering process. That, that aging and that time is what gives rise to high-level kusumono, and we really don't tamper with that. That's the value of the age, and that's where the plant takes over in terms of the creative guidance. But for stakusa in bonsai display, we don't want to show uh, the unmanicured soil as, as the delivery of the finished product in display. All right, uh, getting quite a few responses. It looks like we're pretty split between uh, the pink flowers and the desiplema. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Desa, uh, sorry. Oh, uh, uh, de la sperma. De la sperma. Yes, yeah. that one and the pink flowers. Looks like those are getting the most votes in the chat so far. Well, de la sperma has the pink flowers. Oh, this, just kidding. Well, then that one is getting the most votes. That, this is the one, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think it's the same. <laughs> yeah, and but yeah, this is. There's some people saying they want taller ones, but. Uh, mostly the pink flowers, yeah. Want taller ones. I mean, if you want taller ones, then that is totally your prerogative. I, 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 don't, I don't have judgment, um, but you're wrong. I'm, just <laughs> <laughs> I'm, totally I'm totally joking. Okay, uh, I'm going to go with this one because I think it's going to be magic. And here's where I think it's going to be magic. The other value, so Horst Heinzel Reiter uh, is an Austrian ceramicist whose work we highly value at Mirai, and his Kusumono containers are, in my mind, the most free, creative, organic, and just absolutely spectacular. They are uh, sometimes elegant, sometimes extremely aggressive, sometimes very harsh, sometimes very uh, beautiful, and, and, and really soft. And 
this piece, when you look at it, the shape of this piece is just really special, right? Because you have this taper here and you have these corners and it's like a UFO and you have this pedestal, there's your drainage hole in the bottom, you have negative space in the feet and, and you have this wonderful band, right? Really spectacular. So my hope in planting something that's gonna drape is that it'll drape around these corners and these corners will always be present between the foyer mats. And I'm gonna orient when I, when I create this because I think that color combination of having the plant spill over that is gonna be really, really spectacular. So as we build this, uh, my goal is to keep that intact so that we're able to uh, witness that in the finished product, at least as it's created today. Now, do we prune them? Do we fertilize them? You know, do, do, we, do we aesthetically manipulate them? What does that look like? Do we maintain them, right? These are all the questions that when you start to talk about each individual species, there is an action to continue to evolve, direct, guide, and facilitate the best possible quality product out of the plants that we're utilizing in these, in these creations, right? And, you know, to think that we are trying to get Kusumono pieces to grow aggressively like we would a bonsai and we're going to fertilize the living daylights out of them and that's the right way to go is incorrect. But to think that they don't need any care, that they don't need to be pruned or cleaned or maintained uh, over the course of time is also incorrect. And I would say that there is a very mild, very, very mild necessity to be doing uh, uh, aspects of maintenance on Kusumono. Uh, cleaning them two to three times a year, taking out the dead, pruning back overly vigorous or, or uh, potentially weak areas, uh, opening up negative space where they've maybe thrived too much, uh, giving them a dose of fertilizer once, once uh, every, every one to two months just to keep them nutritioned in their constricted environment, et cetera. These are the ways that we continue to perpetuate the best behaviors in terms of blooming, in terms of health, in terms of robust uh, but not overly aggressive foyer growth is a moderate pulled back approach compared to how we would pursue this as bonsai, right? And so inside of that, we get, we get that kind of capacity to not be as, as uh, uh, day in, day out finicky and tampering with our kusumono, but we have those moments where we say, hey, I'm past the repotting season right now, most of our elongating species are pruned. It's spring. This is the most opportune time to be handling the root systems and aggressively reducing our kusumono. Let's create a few compositions and, uh, and talk about it as a subject matter, right? That's, that's kind of the degree to which we're able to engage with kusumono at Mirai. And this is also, again, and I, and I continue to go back to succulents because we're dealing with them tonight, but I continue to go back to succulents because succulents are such an accessible an absolutely accessible, spectacular uh, characteristic that some plants have that allow us to create kusumono in a very low maintenance and high success, high accessibility, affordable way, okay? Now, I'm gonna be pushing this root system, and I've reduced it quite a bit, through this rather small orifice in this container. I put a layer of akadama down below, Okay, I inserted one portion of that, and now I'm just gonna use the chopstick, much like I used with the rock taco, to be able to seat that plant in there. Okay, now as we can see, it's not quite of the orientation that we want. So I'm just gonna use my chopstick to continue to kind of move the roots inside of that container and get this piece to really sit down and kind of embrace the, the, the nuance of, of this piece that Horst has created. And already you can kind of see, it's a little bit of a, little bit of a mop, a little bit of an afro, but we recognize, oh, okay, this is gonna drape quite nicely and this is gonna creep and this is gonna crawl in a way that, that is going to be spectacular over the course of time. I'm gonna take the liberty at this point in time to just go ahead and kind of tease out some of these pieces that might be in the way of and actually directionally prune a few of these pieces to kind of stop that from overgrowing that area that we want these to kind of spread and expand across and create the kind of, of uh, open availability of those areas that we said were valuable. Very, very uh, easy way to go ahead and dictate that shape. But notice again, I'm being very, very careful to not overly handle because again, succulents, very, very water-filled, very brittle and very easily broken, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna raise up the foyer mass a little bit 
to fill in the, the, the space that I have here with a little bit of soil. I'm gonna use my chopstick just to integrate that soil into the system. This is gonna take a little while because it's a rather large orifice. So let me go ahead and change the angle here and I'm just gonna work on this and open it up to questions. All right, up next I've got Kevin Ferris. Uh, would this use of Akadama be good to use with Kusumono moss planting that you collect from the hills or the mountains? Would this Akadama? This use of Akadama be good to use with Kusumono moss plantings? Kusumono moss planting. I mean, I mean, I know there's a moss ball, right? Which is more like a muck. That's a muck composition. It's not definitely, um, and there's Akadama dust that would be mixed into that, but not typically granular Akadama. If you're getting some form of intact like a nurse log kind of a vibe um, where you have accent pieces growing on decaying wood or on stone or whatnot. Um, I, I, I guess there's spaces that you could fill with the aggregate Akadama, but I might not be understanding exactly what you're asking, uh, Kevin. So let me know if, 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 I, if I've misunderstood. All right, I'll come back to that one. Uh, Elias wants to know if you've ever thought about doing a cactus kusumono. I think it would be a great pair with a collected juniper. <laughs> You know, it's funny. Um, there was a there was a cactus artist, which is which is interesting to say, yeah, like 20, 30 years ago, for somebody to say there's a bonsai artist out there, everybody had been like, what? A what? Right? And now we look at plant material, and we're talking about kusumono as an art form, and we're which is an understory plant, and we're talking about you know, the fact that there are cactus artists that are manipulating the way that cactus are growing into the most intensely interesting and odd ways. And it's very long and labor intensive and time intensive and uh, demanding of your horticultural knowledge to manipulate the shape of cactus, right? Uh, but there was a cactus artist that did an exhibition with a ceramic artist in, I believe it was done in, in LA, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And some of the most spectacular living art that I've ever seen. Uh, and the fact that cactus has never been really pushed into the realm of material that can be truly artistically managed and handled by the container selection is really unfortunate. So as I was driving back from Joy Creek today, I just, as I look at Jonathan Cross's work specifically, I just think, man, to not pair this with cactus and to not be using cacti as one of the as one of the 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 um, you know sort of genres of plants that we are exploring in in kusumono or cactus mono or whatever you whatever you want to call it right uh, is really unfortunate and I th yeah I think there's a lot of room there why would we and ultimately what this comes down to and this is exactly why I started off by saying listen it's not just a perennial thing this could be an annual thing in terms of you can use one one of the more beautiful things I used to see every summer was buckwheat um, put into a shallow non-bond container in this this wide, shallow, round container housing these, this beautiful vertical bushel of flowering wheat. And it was just one of the most indicative seasonal, inf, uh, seasonal references that existed for me in my time in Japan. And I just thought, yeah. And you know, the thing about wheat is it's, it's there for a year. It goes through its cycle. It sets seed and, and then it's gone. And, and there's like a, a, a real beauty to that uh, ephemeral quality and characteristic. There's a real beauty to the very slow, seemingly unchanging shape and evolution of cactus. And I think inside of that, there's a wonderful opportunity to really do something quite spectacular with cactus. I'm glad that you brought that up. And I think that's a really uh, interesting way to kind of, you know, segue out of this notion of succulence and move beyond it to see, oh, right, okay. This act that we're performing, we're just scratching the surface. We say it on Mariah all the time. We're just at the very beginning. Do you realize how much more time we've spent with bonsai than kusumono? I mean, we're talking about decades in North America of effort that we've put into bonsai. And I would say, Although people have practiced shtakusa 
and Kusumono to a degree. Young Cho and, and, uh, and a few other individuals have really brought that art form to the forefront and really started to create pieces that are inspiring a different perspective of how we observe and, and, and look at this in ways that allow us to utilize these plants in a, in a much more valuable way, okay? And so I think the, the sky is the limit and cactus absolutely should be explored, all right? So, you know, just to kind of round out the compositions that we've created here, all, all facing you, all facing you, you. Okay, just to round out the compositions that we've created here out of the succulents tonight, singular pieces, we dealt with color as well as height, size, and the choice of ceramics. We dealt a little bit more with texture and, and context here. And we dealt a lot with the vessel actually being the selection device for this piece that eventually will spill out, hopefully onto the table and lay out in a big, beautiful display. There are so many different avenues that we have the ability to access. Succulents, super popular in modern culture. There's a way to handle succulents in manners that even elevate them to that next level and really allow us to tap into an entirely different and really beautiful aesthetic. Okay, I'll open it up to questions to finish it off. I had a good time. The seed, this, this falling out actually led to, I think, a higher quality uh, product in the end because the orientation of the plant is better the second time around. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Some serendipity. All right, I've uh, got a question. Uh, returning to Kevin Ferris's question, he's saying that they collected a moss planting from a rock and they're putting it into a pot with some organic soil. Would ah. Akadama be a better substitute? Um, if he collected moss from a rock, then that moss is designed to grow on an aggregate surface. And as a result, to put it in organic soil is going to be the death of the moss. So I think your best bet is to use an aggregate soil, which would be like a 111 pumice lava akadama. And when we look at that, when we talk about moss for kusumono, for stakusa, or for bonsai, it's moss that comes off of aggregate surfaces that is capable of occupying the aggregate soil that we have to utilize based on the confined environment of these smaller containers. So I think, Kevin, I think you need some aggregate. Um, Akadama definitely, but adding a little pumice or lava to that would even encourage its success. All right, uh, up next is Treebeard Steve. He says, in display, is a kusumono usually accompanied by an accent of some sort? Okay, well, yeah, and I, and I mean, I don't want to harp on this too much, but I, I do want to make the point. Kusumono is a standalone piece. Shitakusa is a, a, a piece that goes with the tree. And I know Steve, Treebeard Steve, you're probably like, okay, that's semantics. Just tell me what the freaking grass is supposed to do, right? <laughs> but when we're talking about it being displayed with bonsai, it, it, it really becomes shtakusa. So what was the question, Eve? Uh, the question was basically, does kusumono itself have something to accompany it? So in display, is kusumono usually accompanied by its own accent? I totally didn't listen to your question, Treebeard Steve. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I think Kusumono, when you, when you treat it as a standalone piece, can, can be a standalone piece, but when you, if you were to exhibit it, I think you would exhibit it with accompanying elements. Com accompanying elements might be uh, a surface upon which the, the, the composition is presented so that it has intentionality and effort put towards it. Uh, I would imagine that there are accoutrements that could be utilized depending on what the inspiration or reference is. Is this a, a reference to Japanese kusumono and now we might have a kakijuku or a scroll with it or a figurine that would be an accompaniment uh, with the piece. I don't know if you've ever checked out bonsai uh, moto world, moto world, like motocross motorcycles, bonsai moto world on Instagram. It's Mario Comstaw. Mario Comstaw is a bonsai professional who, who uh, is working in Spain he and I were both in Japan at the same time. He studied with Mr. Arushibata down in Shizuoka. I studied with Mr. Kimura. Uh, Mar Mario, incredibly talented bonsai practitioner, but he is also an insanely talented Kusumono and Shitakusa artist. I mean, like, go through his Instagram feed, look at his displays, and he treats them. He's obviously pursuing it from a very formal, traditional Japanese perspective, or at least he's handling display in that fashion. Um, 
really moving the way that he utilizes the understory plants as the target singular focus of his displays for those seasonal discussions. Um, and that can be some inspiration, but I think there's also room. Bear in mind, again, take this contextually into consideration. Bonsai has been being practiced hardcore in North America post-World War II, right? Uh, Kusumono is something that we're all just like, what is this? Like, how did this get started? Like, do any of us know the history of Kusumono? Do we know where it started? Do we know who did it? Do we, do we know how it came to be? Was this like an, uh, an Edo period art form of, of samurai finding that contrast to, you know, chopping off arms and, and defending the daimyo? Like, is that what this is? Or, or did this come about afterwards? You know, I, I, I know Saburo Kato did Kusumono. Did somebody before him, did he come up with it? it was like, where, where did this exist? And, and I don't know anybody that knows that information. Um, so for us, we're at the very beginning of like thinking about this and all of those things. And display is going to be another one, Steve, where I think there's a lot of room to interpret and expand upon what would traditionally be practiced in, in a tokenoma setting. All right. Uh, up next, I've got a theoretical question from Sarah. She says, it feels like there's some sort of hierarchy between bonsai and kusumono. The distinction seems to be based on the fact that there is more attention to detail and rules with bonsai, but actually there is no reason that the same cannot be applied to kusumono. What is it that inherently makes kusumono less valuable? Hmm. I think, well, I, and I'll just tell you this, there are kusumono that are far more valuable than a majority of the bonsai that we look at. So just to, just to sort of like reframe, like I'm saying these pieces cost me $6 a piece at, at a, a, a local nursery and we can turn them into kusumono, but give these pieces 30 years and I'm not gonna sell it back to you for six bucks, right? So, so value comes with time maturity quality of the container, com uh, the combination of the plant and container and the way that they marry together over the course of time. And, and, and age typically becomes the aspect of value. Well, what's the aspect of value in bonsai? It's age, right? It's age. Uh, whether we're talking about trunk girth or an impressive root spread or uh, you know, a beautiful transition of branching or uh, dead wood or twists, anything that bark, anything that we look at that draws us to a bonsai uh, typically reflects age in some way, shape, or form. And, 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 and we pay for that, right? Like, uh, we all can't sow our own seeds and, and end up with a mature bonsai, um, you know, or, or maybe we don't want to, to give it that kind of time. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. And kusumono is exactly the same. And I think beyond that, you know, even to, to uh, obtain a, a understory plants, they tend to propagate more easily. They tend to uh, have the capacity to spread and occupy space, which means that they can fill a container uh, in a shorter period of time. And so the, it does demand to find kusumono of, a, 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 of an intense value demands time and the same amount of care that bonsai does, right? And that's where I'm saying, I don't want to devalue kusumono by saying, hey, listen, everybody can do kusumono, but honestly, everybody can do bonsai, everybody can do kusumono. We have to invest less to do kusumono uh, and we can get a lot of immediate gratification out of it, especially when we use succulents, because they demand less horticultural awareness, attention, skill, and knowledge, and we can have a little more fun, be a little bit more liberal in our creativity, and tap into all of these different design elements that allow us to create interesting compositions. All right, up next is Andrew M. He says, I've collected some lava chunks. Uh, how would that work as a container? So amazing, like lava is uh, outstanding. Form, texture, color, lava is brilliant. I love lava, I have a lot of lava sitting outside of the workshop at Mirai. Lace rock is brilliant. Uh, even a flat, think about this, a flat slab of slate, uh, Pennsylvania bluestone, uh, an irregular chunky piece of granite. What do you put on a chunky piece of granite? Like how do you take that mass of granite or the light color of granite and combine it with a, a, an understory plant that can survive on that surface and complement it aesthetically. This is the value. You're tapping into the exploration of Kusumono. This is where there's room to interpret, to place value, to, to say I want complementary or analogous, to say I want 
consistency of texture or I want to contrast the texture. To say I want the form to be the same or different, that, that's where the artistic merit and the room to really create your own interpretation exists. Uh, Joe wanted to know if the pot will deteriorate over time with watering. And I, I wonder if they were actually talking about the, uh, the very last one you worked on, the horse, the blue and white one. Oh, no, it's a, it's a fired and glazed. Uh, this isn't painted on. It's not uh, painted on. It's glazed. So it's actually vitrified. Uh, that's not going anywhere uh, anytime soon. All right. Uh, up next, we've got Chuck. He says, I know I'm pushing it, but what about including a small, young, woody tree or bushes often used for bonsai in kusumono or stakusa arrangements? I've seen some very cool maple seed seedlings used in spring arrangements. I just added a uh, corkia contoniaster behind some small pink erodium flowers and yellow-green sedum to give off a gruff, twiggy, rocky outcrop reference to the composition. Yeah. I've got a piece uh, out in the garden that is a uh, coral bark Japanese maple in a blue me and Ramondi radical pot. In fact, give me, give me one second. Let me, let me just grab this because Chuck, I think you opened up another dialogue. Okay, so <clears throat> this me and Ramondi piece I just thought was so, was so incredibly amazing. Really, really interesting. And it came in the shipment and I set it aside because I was like, that's gotta be mine. And then I had these coral bark maples, which are, which are actually, older genetic sangukaku Japanese maples, right? And when I say older genetic, when you look at this, only the twigs have a slight reddish hue to them. Otherwise, the, the, the bark is, is kind of orange and more than anything over the course of time, it's green. And when you look at genetic mutations of Japanese maple, the, the early genetic mutations don't have as concentrated of a mutation and so it dilutes over time. One of the big nuances of red maples um, that came out with foliage red were that they turned green over the course of summer. And now when you look at red maples, not Acer rubrum, but Acer palmatum, and you look at any of the varieties that stay red, that is a process of genetic, uh, of, of uh, continued propagation and finding mutations upon mutations upon mutations that get you to that. Well, the coral bark maple, you know, now when you look at a coral bark maple, the entire trunk is like iridescent red and, and stays that way. And the twigs are even more brilliant, right? But this is a, an original sangukaku coral bark maple that just has lost its capacity to, to maintain it. So there's some history to this piece. It's a, a historical piece from Seattle um, and, and, and this wonderful pot. And I thought exactly what you're thinking, Chuck, like you have this kind of odd whimsical tree. This isn't a, a valuable bonsai, but it's, but it's beautiful. Like the, the line of the tree is beautiful. And you put it in here with just a little bit of grass and a little bit of ferns inside of that small constricted space. And, and it creates kind of this interesting, like it's not a bonsai, uh, but it's also not a kusamono. It's like a combination of things. It's, it's a gesture of using plant material in a creative way. Uh, that can show seasonality, that can show design nuances, that can show uh, plant relationships or envi environmental context. And, and I think there's no reason, you know, you talk about like bonsai in the show form for the kokfu or for the national show or for the trophy. And you talk about bonsai that's pursued as a, as a, as a freedom of expression, as a, as a creative uh, exploration or exercise. I think that's what this is, right? And I think there's, there's no reason. Sumac is beautiful for this uh, in terms of its informality and you get the seasonality and the fall colors and the form. Uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of long linear drawn out wispy forms lend themselves to creative exploration. So anyways, I don't know. I did the same thing. I think there's room for it all. You know, am I gonna put this, am I gonna enter this in the national show? Uh, as, as, as my demonstration of my bonsai acumen? Uh, no, no, and I'm not, and I'm not gonna care what any single person thinks about this when they come to Mirai, but I think it's pretty cool, you know? Like, I had fun well, making they, it, they isn't love that? It. You know, like, at some <laughs> point, you gotta, like, like what you do. This was fun for me. The, the chat absolutely loves this one, especially that container pairing with it. Uh, isn't really it great? Cool. I mean, look at the proportion and the scale of the maple to the container and the slender legs, and it's elevated, and it stands on its, like, come on. 
Come on. <laughs> that is just, and the, and the little fern and the grass, you know, it's just like this, yeah. And this was put together, this literally took me 10 minutes to put it together. It was just a total whim. And I freaking love it. Right I look on. at it every day. So happy every day. I'm just like, yes. Not going to win any shows with it, but yes. Uh, next question is from Andrew. Uh, this is kind of a broad question, but what are the best species for Kusumuno that age well or look mature after time? Yeah, I think the irises, especially the dwarf irises, are really, really special. Because iris as... Um, and I don't know, I think iris might be a tuber. I'm trying to think what iris is because it, 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 it crawls along whatever the organ is. But in a pot, when you constrict iris, it mounds up and it grows with these rooted structures that overflow the pot, but yet you get these leaves and these little uh, blossoms on it. And I iris is such a special, there's a native Oregon iris every spring that flowers. And it is just, it's like such an attachment to place. And there's irises across the world, right? Uh, I think that's a really special one. I, I, I you know, I love the succulent uh, characteristic plants. I love sedum as generic as it's become in the practice of, of succulent gardening in, 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 you know, modern day apartment life. There's a reason for it. It's durable. It's beautiful. Uh, and the form that it takes on over the course of time is really uh, spectacular. I think that um, some of the really beautiful um, ferns and, uh, and, and, and flowering forms of, of perennials can be absolutely amazing. I think some of the grasses, whether you go with the, the standard Japanese blood grass that gives you a red green and it's incredibly vertical, or you start to go with some of the more free form um, sedges and, and, and uh, carrots and some of these varieties that sort of billow out of the container and take on this real wispy uh, kind of uh, organic free form. Some of the miscanthuses with their seed heads. You know, I talked about the wheat, I, like, it's just such an, when you start to explore the understory, it's such an expansive world, far more expansive than trees, far more expansive, are all of the weeds, grasses, and tiny plants that we step on and never ever look at. And Kusumono, much like bonsai, changes our impression of trees from being a tree to being a maple tree or a pine tree. And then beyond that, a ponderosa pine tree or uh, a vine maple. And then beyond that, like uh, a subspecies of your standard ponderosa pine. It's a scopulorum because it's from the Rocky Mountain variety, from the Rocky Mountain region, and it has this needle care, right? Like we get deeper and deeper and deeper, and we never see trees the same again when we practice bonsai. Kusumono has that power. It has that power. A dandelion could be one of the most phenomenal kusumono to discuss the urban environment. You can deadhead dandelion, never let them go to seed. They will flower throughout the growing season. You can eat the flowers if you fry them and they're delicious. And it has an incredibly vigorous capacity to be a great kusumono. I mean, like, it's a real expansive world that we've never explored. All right. Our last question is from Richard. He says, over time, how uh, will you have to prune and how is ramification accomplished if so? Yeah. So this is the interesting thing about kusumono, right? because now we're looking at perennial plants that may or may not need to be cut back, to be taken back to the base, to be refreshed uh, on a, on a you know, semi-annual or annual basis. And so for our succulent pieces, the majority of the work is going to be cleaning out the dead stuff, potentially reducing overly vigorous, or pieces that we don't want to continue to highlight. We talked about these points on this container as something that will guide any sort of aesthetic manipulation of the growth habit of the sedum. But beyond that, beyond cleaning out the dead, beyond adjusting my care requirements, um, and beyond sort of adapting the, the, the shape to guide the visibility and interaction with the containerized environment, I'm not gonna do much here. I'm not gonna do much here. I might have to prune back the, the overly long pieces on this sedum periodically because they'll get big, they'll get floppy, maybe they get a rainfall and they all lay down, and I choose to go ahead and start afresh 
reduce and grow new pieces. When we deal with grasses, we have to clean out the dead. Oftentimes we might take grasses back to the base depending on the species. But for a lot of grasses, we just clean out the dead, we leave the verticals and we call it good. It depends on what we're dealing with variety, variety wise and species wise, how we go about handling that. But this is again, where we take that next step into the Kusumono process and to the Kusumono knowledge of the art form. It becomes a nuanced application specific to the variety, much like bonsai is. Ramification and things like that in Kusumono can occur with different varieties. If we're using a sumac, the more ramification, the better, right? But when we start to talk about these pieces, it's really cultivating them at a slow, consistent rate so that they fill up and start to fill, uh, uh, expand outside of that container. That's when we get the age. That's when we get the uniqueness. That's when we get things that we can't create by going to a nursery, buying a plant and sticking it in the pot. 10 years from now, what each of these is gonna look like is going to be so monumentally different than what they look like now, but they look pretty awesome now, right? And, and we get to enjoy every step of the way. All right, and our last question, sorry, I lied, there's one more. Uh, yeah, you did Aaron lie. snuck one in. How would a vertical stone with moss growing on it work as a kusumono? All right, so, you're yeah, right. Uh, this is a really interesting proposition. I did an exhibition uh, an installation at uh, Aesop, which is a company, if, if you don't know about Aesop, a skincare company, but they go far beyond skincare. Their acumen in, de in the design world is like super peak. And I was thinking about taking a ton of Jan Kulik slabs and vertical stones and covering them in moss <clears throat> and having that be my installation. I didn't do it. I ended up doing something different for the installation. Um, but I think this is rock and roll. I think this is really, really cool. One of the most uh, powerful Kusumono or, or Stakusa pieces that I've ever seen was an elongated rectangular pot that was just moss that had naturalized inside of it and contoured. And it, ha it was very clear it was not made. It was grown because there was not a single seam in that moss, yet the way that it had filled that container was like, I I've never seen anything like that. Uh, and, and, it, and it really helped me understand that Moss is an understory plant. Lichen is an understory plant, just the same as a fern is an understory plant or a sedum is an understory plant. Like when you dive into the world of Kusumono, you start to recognize like, how have I not thought about this this entire time? Like there is a, a world, there's a miniature ecosystem here that is happening on a daily basis and I step on it. I walk right over it. I don't pay attention to it. I think there's a lot to be explored. I think there is an entirely different level of awareness of our environment to be tapped into through the practice of these little plants, right? Much the same as bonsai on the tree form. Th this is a special subject matter here and it's accessible to all of us. We're lucky in that way. Hopefully you take this information. Hopefully there was something inspirational here and hopefully this demystified it enough that you, you go out, you find your own little plant of interest you find a nice container and you take the plunge and, and dig in deep because it really is as, as effortless as you wanna make it or as intense as you wanna make it. You get to guide your own journey, but it is a special journey at that. Sorry about that, a little bit of dog at the end. Uh, that is a wrap on our questions and we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you guys post some of your Kusumoto compositions in the forum. Yes, yes, show us what you make. I love that. For anybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, start your free trial, live.bonesimerai.com. We got more Kusumoto content and a whole bunch more. Super Tuesday, thank you all. Love you, have a good night. Mwah!